and every chapter um, you have something new to learn most of the topics are new for you to learn it's not a, a continuation of what the content you've learned in the last uh, paper last semester most of them are new and the number of chapters are also so many are there okay so much content to learn and yet i am not taking you on a slower note i am i'm going very fast you see the space is really fast only it's not very uh, one class one model kind of thing in three hour session we are doing around about three to four chapters we are finishing in uh, a time span of three hours one day one chapter kind of thing is not going on okay so you are learning lot of content that's one aspect of it this is not just the end of learning the content but applying this content in case studies that also one every topic one case study i should be um, i mean the students should be practicing if time permits i would also have done but time is not available we don't have so much time we don't have that uh, luxury of doing multiple case studies but at least i should be uh, taking you through the case studies how how do we answer those case studies what approach should be uh, taken up by the students and uh, how do we read through the content analyze that present in your answer at least so i need to fit into once in a while at least one or two case studies so for that i need to maintain the space if at all if there is any issue um, uh, with any particular topic content style of delivery anything you can always approach um, me put a message um, a direct message to me so that no one else reads that message you write something also i will not mind because i do not know who you are you are just a student there on the other side of the device that's it nothing more than that so don't have to feel uh, anything about that you can always um, present your issues doubts and then uh, we can take it up and then um, get it clarified done we'll continue uh, with our content the next topic the next topic is corporate governance the governance general principle that chapter seven. corporate governance is the um, chapter we need to understand what is corporate governance first okay there is a definition of corporate governance the definition of corporate governance says that the system by which companies are directed and controlled in the interest of the shareholders and other stakeholders company is an artificial person it comes into existence when the owners establish that company the owners or we also call them as for a company the owners are the shareholders so the owners of the shareholders when they invest their amount into a company company comes into existence but shareholders do not manage the affairs of the company so who manages um, the affairs of the company the management the board of directors the strategic level or the senior managers top managers of the organization they manage the affairs of the company see the investment is made into company by the shareholders this is just the investment but management is not with the shareholders they do not manage the day to day affairs okay so the day to day affairs of the company the management is taken care by the strategic leaders of the company and when they earn the profit that profit is enjoyed by the shareholders so the management is acting in the capacity of an agent the management is now the agent because they are working on we have their of managing the affairs of the company and earning the profits to be enjoyed by the shareholders okay so the capacity 
they are in the capacity of an agent on behalf of the principal and the principal is the principal is the shareholders and other stakeholders so in their interest in their benefit the decisions are taken so the definition it talks about the system by which companies companies are directed and controlled in the interest for whom uh, for whose benefit are they working they are working in the benefit for the benefit of the shareholders the investors and all the other stakeholders so that concept is called as corporate governance that's the meaning of corporate governance the system by which companies are directed and controlled in the interests of shareholders and other stakeholders okay um we see that um, shareholders when the company is um, controlled and managed the, the ownership um, we see the ownership is with the shareholders they own the company because they invest their uh, amount into the company they are the owners so but they do not manage the affairs of the company so this authority is delegated to the board of directors or the top management and these board of directors control the affairs of the company to achieve the objectives shareholders have established the company to maximize their profit or to achieve whatever is the purpose which they want to achieve see along with profit maximization it could be um, customer satisfaction it could be providing quality products and services to the customers etc so whatever is the purpose there is some objective of the company so the shareholders establish the company to achieve that objective but since they do not uh, manage the affairs of the company the authority is delegated to the top management or the board of directors they take decisions they man manage the affairs of the business they control the business and achieve the objectives so these objectives should be the same objectives as the objectives of the organization the purpose with which the company was established if it is not equal then it is poor corporate governance otherwise it is good corporate governance okay so here we identify that there is a agency relationship between the shareholders and the um and the management so management uh, acts in the capacity of agent for the principal shareholders there are 10 key concepts of corporate governance there are 10 key concepts of corporate governance um i'll put another slide um was the here we just see that there are um, um points given what are the 10 key concepts uh, little in detail uh, explanation we will look into uh, what these 10 key concepts are i'll put another uh, ppt only for understanding these particular uh, key concepts the first one says is fairness first key concept of governance is fairness fairness is um not having a uh, uh, favorable um, attitude or um, not showing any kind of um, favoritism or uh, partiality towards a particular stakeholder but it talks about a sense of equality in dealing with internal stakeholders so a sense of even handedness in dealing with external stakeholders an ability to reach an equitable judgment fairness fair attitude equitable uh, equitable judgment because um, if there is a biased attitude if the show favoritism to somebody um, then the decision would also have that impact on them. so a uh, de decisions that are taken without uh, 
um, having any kind of an impact um, their uh, unbiased attitude and impartial attitude uh, uh, not having um, any such thing any such attitude but in with all fairness dealing with that see, in equity in equities uh, treating all the stakeholders uh, equally uh, equity um, that's fairness in in terms of dealing with because see when internal external analysis are taken up they do understand what are the weaknesses internally they do understand what are the threats that are present in the external environment considering that the decision should be taken so in all fairness the decision the judgment should be taken that's the first attitude uh, first attribute here or the key concept of corporate governance so corporate governance is about effectively managing the affairs of the company for the benefit of the stakeholders that's the corporate governance so when they are managing not their own company which they are running but it is someone else business which they are managing that that's the concept of keeper uh, that's the concept of corporate governance so when they are managing the affairs of some others uh, company some others business so they have to have that equity uh, equity attitude or fairness attitude they cannot um, have a biased attitude towards any of the stakeholders internal nor external but with all equity with all fairness the decision should be taken that's the first attribute second one is openness and transparency okay openness uh, and transparency um, whatever are their decisions whatever uh, they decide there should be transparency in that see the decision that they take um, uh, it is not um holding back any information but uh, making it clear that uh, openness should be there the transparency should be there in terms of how they are taking decision that's openness and transparency innovation um monotonously doing the same work again and again uh, instead of doing that think about innovative ways in which the work can be carried out the decisions what they take right from the um, managing the affairs of the company and reporting of the uh, financial transactions uh, in every aspect of it wherever it is possible to bring about a change to bring about some improvement to bring about innovation into the way they are doing that see um if they, there is no innovation if they go with conformity if they go with uh, the same old methods maybe they will not be able to explore any better ways of doing the work and thus achieving any kind of efficiency that would not be a possibility therefore uh, innovation occurs when a firm transforms knowledge and ideas into new products process and systems for the benefit of firm and its shareholders uh, stakeholders so need to find out what are the different ways uh, innovative ways in which the activities can be carried out so that is that should be brought about it is just not continuing with the same old methods and ways of doing the work but rather think about how Uh, differently they can do the work innovatively they can think about and do the work that's innovation third one is skepticism skepticism yesterday also we discussed about uh, skepticism um that questioning attitude instead of uh, going along with what is go, um, being carried on in the organization look at whether it is really beneficial for the company or not so that's skepticism um they have to have that so think about whether it is actually beneficial for the company for the stakeholders next one is independence independence they have to have that independence from personal influence of senior management for non executive directors we will be discussing today so we we may not be discuss i will come back to that slide we we have to discuss about um, the different types of uh, directors who constitute the 
um, top management. So in that category, uh, I will have to talk to you right away. So we will not uh, be doing that. We will be discussing about uh, NEDs, non-executive directors. So the composition of who would be there uh, as part of the board of directors, we will be discussing. But right away, though, at least in two, two classes, at least we will not be coming till this point. But nevertheless, at this point of time, just remember that there should be independence. So what does it mean by uh, independence in terms of the CT? So it talks about independence from personal influence of senior management for non-executive directors. The board of directors, the top management, that board constitutes different um, categories of directors, BC executive directors, BC non-executive directors. See, because the uh, executive directors, they receive their remuneration from the company, okay? Um, their decisions is, um, um, are dependent on the, uh, the amount of benefit which they are receiving. See, if they are um, benefited on account of uh, uh, some reflection of the, um, the situation, the profitability. So to just project that uh, they may agree for whatever comes their way um, because their remuneration is connected to the performance of the company. That can result in they also being involved in some kind of a manipulation, manipulation of the finance. Someone who is a non-executive director, his remuneration does not come. He's not directly receiving his uh, monthly salary or remuneration from the company. Of course, he receives some honorarium from the company, there's some benefit, but um, he always has that independence in terms of taking decisions. So independence from personal influence of senior management, they need not be um, subject to receiving a benefit. So they cannot, they need not be under the pressure of receiving a personal benefit from the senior management. So their decisions could be independent. They need not come under that influence. So that's the point of it. So corporate governance, at least one portion or one part of the board of directors should be with the non-executive directors where uh, they do not have that personal influence of the senior management on them. And therefore they either agree or they disagree or uh, decisions can be taken in that particular manner. So they, we see that the corporate governance should have that kind of independence, should not be subject to any kind of personal influence of anyone in the senior management. So that is independence. Okay. Then the decisions that are taken are unbiased. Next to key, uh, key concept is probity and honesty. Honesty, we know that is self-explanatory. Honesty in financial and positional reporting. So when the uh, financial reporting takes place, there should be without any kind of misrepresentation or misleading information included in that. So honesty or probity. There is something mentioned about a foundation ethical stance in both principle and rule-based system. Right now, though, I'm not explaining, but I will explain about what is uh, rule-based corporate governance, what is principle-based corporate governance. Depending on the availability of time, maybe in today, or in the coming uh, next week when we have the classes, we will um, take it up. Next one, responsibility. See, when decisions are taken, see, uh, corporate governance is basically uh, managing and controlling the affairs of the company. So um, when it is about managing the affairs of the company, certain decisions have to be taken up. Um, these decisions, when they are taking, there should be, uh, some amount of responsibility to be taken up by the management um, in terms of uh, the decisions that they take. So willingness to accept liability for the outcome of governance decisions. So that's responsibility. So <coughs> clarity in the definition of roles and responsibilities and then 
see to what extent they would be responsible and willingness to take up the responsibility okay conscientious business and personal behavior when they are willing to take up the responsibility then there would be accountability okay accountability for the decisions which they take willingness to take up responsibility based on that they would be held accountable uh, if any decision is not appropriate so that accountability is another thing it's just not about their willingness to take up responsibility they are also held responsible for the decisions that are taken by them they have to consider the reputation the developing and sustaining personal reputation through other moral virtue so it also focuses on the um, ethical values ethical uh, stances which they take um, when they uh, take up the uh, when they take decisions for the corporate judgment judgment is without any um, biased attitude um, all by unbiased attitude um, able to take the best possible uh, judgment or decision uh, in that uh, scenario prevailing they can apply the knowledge taken from the previous situation business acumen and then take a um, judgment ability to reach and communicate meaningful conclusions to arrive at a conclusion the ability to weigh up numerous issues and give each due, due consideration then <clears throat> development of a balanced evaluated approach to making business decisions and personal relationships covering intellectual and moral aspects so ability to take the best possible decision for the organization integrity integrity is the last one integrity talks about uh, doing the right thing in all situations what ought to be done has to be done in all situations even if they are not under observance Uh, observation by anyone it is an underlying and underpinning principle of corporate governance and it is required that all those representing shareholders interest in agency relationships both possess and exercise absolute integrity in all times even if there is no one observing them also they have to exhibit that integrity okay integrity in terms of looking at the best uh, working in the best interest of the shareholders and the other stakeholders so that's about integrity so these are 10 key concepts please learn them the content is there in the study text please learn them learn them very well understand that in the case study they may ask you to elaborate on what are the key concepts applicable in that particular situation so unless and until you have that clarity conceptually you will not be able to apply those key concepts to that particular situation okay please read through the study text as the topics are being covered in the class you also put an effort from your end to go through the content which is there in the exam um, study text study text okay as in men it is possible i will also make you do uh, solve few questions from the examination kit otherwise when um, see also along with that whenever you find time to practice few questions you should be taking up it taking it up from the exam kit but after monday i think we will have a clarity about how we will be proceeding for the next slide here talks about what are the operational areas affected by corporate governance see areas of organization affected by corporate governance we see that um, we have board of directors the board of directors the board committees the different types of committees we will be running through that um, you know it looks very um, basic um, i mean to kind of a dry topic that what are the roles and responsibilities of who all constitute board of directors the executive directors non executive directors then we have different types of committees nomination committee remuneration committee audit committee what are the roles responsibilities duties etc um i'll try to present it as in a better manner um 
trying to understand that with an illustration or something, we will do that. So we understand what are the duties and functions. Then we see uh, the composition and um, how the reporting is taken up um, by them. Then uh, we have to discuss about the director's remuneration and uh, how it can have an impact on the decisions that are taken. Director's remuneration and issues related to the remuneration. Um, the relations with shareholders, is it uh, institutional uh, investors or institutional or is it private? Then when it comes to accountability and audit, accountability and audit, um, see we will have to study in detail about the risk and internal control. So there's a framework which is studied. That would be connected to the uh, corporate governance also. So to have an um, effective internal control system installed in the organization so that uh, risk can be effectively managed to ensure that um, no uh, fraud happens in the future. So there is a reason beyond that, uh, behind that, about um, many accounting frauds that have happened uh, across the world and how it has affected uh, many um, economies in the uh, global scenario, how, how what impact it had. So we will be studying about risk and internal control and we will be looking into about the uh, audit part of it. As I have just now explained to you about um, the agency theory. Agency theory, we see that the principal is the shareholders. The board of directors are acting in the capacity of agents in terms of achieving the object, which is the task that is managing the company. So the agents manage on behalf of the principal and the accountability is there. Okay. Principal employs the agents, they work on behalf of the principal and they are accountable. Account, they are also accountable to the principal. They are appointed as agents to perform the task of the company, achieve the objectives. Agency theory and corporate governance. Agency theory and corporate governance first. Company is owned and managed by same people. Expansion is required by investors, shareholders. In case of a limited liability, they do contribute the capital amount to the, uh, to the company. Then delegated running of company to managers. To run the um, affairs of the company, the delegated running of a company to managers, then uh, separation of goals. Goals are, um, and then the agency problem arises. What's the agency problem? What is separation of goals? See, the purpose why the company is established is to ensure that the uh, organizational objectives are achieved. Directors are appointed, they are delegated with authority to control the affairs of the company and ultimately achieve the same objectives. Okay. But if at all, if the, if at all, if the, um, the directors have a different set of objectives, that would be called as dysfunctional behavior on part of the directors. If they are looking at their personal benefit rather than the benefit of the uh, company, then the goals will definitely be different. When the goals are different, then we see the agency problems arise. Uh, No, I was just thinking about, um, should we be taking up a case study about uh, discussing how the agency problems uh, arise and uh, um, they have to be handled? So that's what I was thinking about. Uh, nevertheless, we'll, we'll just discuss about it. Um, I'll look at the time, see if the time is sufficient, it is available. Um, 
one very small case study i would like to um, solve it in the class now or the next class see why is that um, problems arise that that's the importance why is that there is an agency problem when the agents are appointed by the um, investors by the shareholders um, the agents should work in the um, best interest of the shareholders but if they do not um, act in the best interest of the um shareholders then um, what is the issue is what we will be looking into just um i'm not sure whether i will be able to fit in fit uh, the case study here or not um, but let's see what are the key concepts of agency theory the key concepts of agency theory we see that there is an agent employed by the principal um, agency is the relationship they have between them the there is a principal appointing the agents to work on their behalf so there is a relationship which is existing which is the agency Uh, there are agency costs that are incurred so whatever is the uh, cost that is incurred to make the payment to the shareholders and the um, benefits that are provided to the shareholders okay the authority is delegated but the accountability is always there so there is accountability there is a fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the board of directors towards the shareholders so there is a fiduciary responsibility then they have to work in the best interest of the stakeholders so stakeholders are shareholders and other stakeholders the best interest of the customers and the um, other stakeholders government for towards everybody every stakeholder they have a responsibility now this is in terms of achieving the overall objectives of the organization okay there are few examples of what are costs of agency relationship the incentive schemes for directors we need to focus on this one see there are uh, from time to time on achieving certain target there are incentives announced to the directors um see providing and reviewing the data that is um, um for the performance measurement providing and reviewing data meetings have to be conducted from time to time to take decisions then when decisions are taken some of the decisions involve risk they have to base their decisions on the uh, the aspect that risk is involved whether they would want to accept risk or not see risk if it is accepted why would anyone accept risk what's the relationship between risk and return any one of you is there any relationship with, between risk and return risk is high return is high so um intentionally accepting those um decisions or proposals or projects where there is higher risk of course see when they Um, when the risk is high, the returns are high, so that is the motivating factor. But then there is always um, an aspect that they can be hit by the risk. See, the downside risk is risk is not always negative, but more uh, most of the time it is looked in from a negative aspect only. If at all if they are hit by a negative risk uh, that arises. accountability comes into picture so the ability to take up or accept higher risk accepting higher risk monitoring the behavior behavior of how they are uh, taking the decisions and what is in, being implemented in spite of managing the risk see risk management we will be studying after a while in spite of managing the risk all risks are not controllable some of the risk 
can be controlled. Most of the risks are controlled with an effective risk management system. Uh, the process, when it is implemented, risk can be effectively managed so that the impact can be reduced. In spite of that, if at all, if there is some more loss that is remaining, what do they do with that? So you have to they, um, I mean, they have to accept that residual loss or risk that is present. So that is the, the residual loss, even if they are not effectively managing also the some amount of risk that can be remaining. So these are the costs of agency relationship. So when there are agents that are appointed to look into the affairs of the company, anyway, the remuneration, the incentives, the bonus, all those things which are paid to the agents. Apart from that, the, the um, principal also has to spend some time in terms of providing and reviewing data and meetings to be participated to the cost of uh, the management taking decisions which involve risk, see if they are affected by the risk, um, what impact does it have and to constantly monitor their behavior, the management behavior and uh, how do they deal with if at all, if there is any uh, amount of, any amount of uh, risk which is still remaining even after managing the risk. See, agency problem um, resolution measures. Um, meetings should be conducted with the principal uh, key investors. Voting at the AGM, annual general meeting. So stake, uh, shareholders, um, the ordinary equity shareholders have the voting rights proportional to the amount of shares which they uh, own in the company. So when decisions are to be taken, they have to cast their vote uh, for a particular decision. So um, by participating in the annual general meeting and voting for the decisions, they can uh, look into how the decisions are taken by the uh, agents or the board of directors. Then arrive at resolutions at AGMs and then accepting takeovers, divestment of shares. Um, so the control can be diluted. The accepting takeovers. Um, so whoever are the shareholders, um, then uh, they, they have the voting powers with them. So they uh, can participate in the decision making. The, if, if the um, takeovers are accepted, then um, we see that um, um, the, there would be other shareholders also coming into picture. So there, there we uh, uh, see that the control uh, which is there um, uh, in terms of taking decisions, that could be diluted, accepting uh, takeover. Uh, if they withdraw their investment uh, um, from uh, any unit of the business, divestment, so some of the units seem to be quite attractive. So uh, the focus is all in terms of being benefited out of that and then the decisions could be taken could be in favor of that. So if they consider divestment, then uh, the attractive part can be separated from the business unit and the uh, decisions that are taken by the management also will be affected to that particular extent. So. divestment of uh, shares. The agency accountability, how do they bring about accountability of the board of directors into that? So act in shareholders' uh, um, interest. They have to act in shareholders' interest, but we will be looking into certain examples and situations uh, where they do not act in the best interest of the shareholders, but uh, they act in their personal interest. So that's called as... Um, dysfunctional behavior that also we will be looking into the agency accountability is when they act in the shareholders interest they have to provide good information as and when it is required without any misrepresentation misinformation being included into the uh, information provided to the management because manage um, to the uh, stakeholders because the stakeholders interest lies with lies uh, with or it is 
connected to the information that is provided because the decisions are dependent on the information. So when the information is provided by the management, this should be without any misleading uh, issues or misleading information being included into that to provide good information. See if the information provided by the management is not reliable, uh, to that extent, decisions also get affected. Okay, okay. Next, operate within legal structure, following all the rules and regulations, the comply with all whatever has to be followed, the rules and regulations. So operate within legal structure. Okay. There are uh, transaction cost theory, external transactions, types of costs are uh, search and uh, search and information, bargaining and decision, policing and enforcement. Um, See so the relevant information that has to be uh, provided, um, all possible measures should be taken up in terms of searching that information and then acquiring that information and providing that information because um, decisions are based on that. Um, decisions are based on the information that is provided. So acquire the best possible uh, information and uh, provide that as and when it is required. That is one aspect. Um, about um, the different types of costs, search and information, then um, ability to take the best possible decision, bargaining and uh, uh, taking arriving at decision and uh, policing and enforcement ensure that it is uh, effectively implemented. Okay, so that would be about the different types of costs that are um, in connection with the agency uh, problems. The, the topics are going kind of dry. So at the end of the class, I'm just looking at uh, if I can provide some topic which, which seems to be a little interesting. Uh, for the past, I think 15, 20 minutes, the topics are all quite dry. Uh, so I'm just looking at what can I um, explain? Should I be starting with the case study? But case study has uh, some of the content uh, which we have not covered. So then uh, that also would not be appropriate. Therefore, I'm just looking at uh, how do I present it little interesting, that's it. Um, so if, it if it were a model or something, I models will be quite um, interesting, but this is uh, a topic which is going on a dry, dry note. One second.
um, transactions cost can be further impacted. See factors impacting the cost. Um, we see that um, there's bounded rationality, there's opportunism, uh, opportunism, sorry. Um, we talk about what are the transaction costs, the transaction costs about uh, um, the different types of costs that are incurred. See, the costs that are incurred uh, in terms of having this agency relationship, see, there are certain costs that are to be um, paid to the um, board of directors, members of board of directors. There are certain other things about uh, monitoring their behavior, looking at what they think they are taking, the responsibility, the accountability. Then we see that um, how um, uh, the information that is provided, they have to acquire that search and acquire that information so that it is uh, useful in that and then how things are to be taken up uh, how do they implement that effectively implement that so all those things are to be taken up so uh, these factors uh, impact in the cost should be bounded by rationality see with, with all fairness see whether it is beneficial for them for the organization or not and then make good of any uh, opportunity that comes their way but then how frequently would they be looking at incurring these costs? So the frequency part of it, we consider the uncertainty of um, the decisions, the benefits that can be derived out of the um, transaction cost that is incurred. And uh, uh, see, the amount of asset specificity, um, see degree of impact on cost, See how frequently will they have an impact because of incurring that cost or what kind of benefit would they get? See whether there would be any amount of benefit which they would be or any impact which they would be received. And uh, uh, see with certainty how long the benefit will uh, be realized. So these aspects have also to be uh, taken into account. Some situation where we can implement or we can put this into a case study, I will try to look into that and then we will see that it can be made a little um, interesting and then um, proceed further. Corporate governance in case of a public sector. The governance part of it, we are uh, learning the concept of governance with respect to how effectively they manage the affairs of it. See, in case of a private sector, uh, the accountability is there towards the uh, shareholders because profit is one important aspect. Of course, along with the shareholders, there are other stakeholders also. Um, they they are um, um, they have to look into the interest of other stakeholders also. But here, the concept of um, external shareholders would not be there. Then, in that case, how how do the the we take into account the corporate governance in case of uh, public sector? The public sector governance, how does it happen? A range of organizations exist in most economies with three types predominant. So one is private sector. In private sector, the objective we see is seeking profit. So profit maximization, seeking profit, earning profit um, for the shareholders and the other stakeholders for the, their benefit, looking into that. Under private sector only, we see that some of the organizations may not be looking at profit maximization. So they are called as charities. They are there in the private sector, run by the private sector, but profit is not their primary objective. So we call them as charities, which are charitable or benevolent. Then we see the public sector. The public sector, the primary objective is to provide services. Delivering goods or services not provided by for profit entities. We also call them as not for profit organizations. Charities and public sector, um, they are not for profit organizations. The concept of governance in a public sector. <clears throat> the later are operated predominantly by the state, self governing autonomous region made up of four sectors, four aspects. We see the government is there. 
the legislature, the judiciary, and secretary. So in case of public sector governance, the four aspects of uh, governance in public sector. First one, there is a government which is elected by the people, they are an elected body. The legislature, it is in the UK Houses of Parliament, in the parliament, the houses that are there. The judiciary, independently appointed. The judiciary, which uh, um, it makes them accountable without being biased by anything. It's an independent body, the judiciary, independently appointed to look at the benefits of the public at large. Then the secretariat, separate administrative body to carry out state functions, for example, education. Public sector governance, who are the stakeholders? Stakeholders are the public sector. We see the stakeholder relationship is more complicated in the public sector. Of particular sensitivity in this context is the use of taxpayers' funds. Otherwise, the funds are raised from, in a private sector, the funds are raised from uh, different sources of capital, equity capital, debt capital. Then uh, they are accountable to earn a profit, profit available to the shareholders. So the accountability comes in terms of what is the amount of profit that is earned on the amount invested by the investors. The, uh, for, from the, uh, the debt amount which is invested, there, would, there, is, there seems to be an obligation to earn uh, returns and pay interest on the debt capital in, on equity capital. The, they have to uh, ensure that the profit is maximized and made available to the uh, shareholders. Here in this case, it is not a separate group of investors, but all the amounts that are collected from the taxpayers, those funds are used to be invested into the public sector. So the concept of accountability. So how do we bring about the accountability into picture is what we will have to look into that of particular sensitivity in this context is the use of taxpayers' funds. These can be perceived to be used for services which are no benefit. Now, this is one important uh, aspect which we need to look into that. Debt holders, they are paid an interest. It, it's an obligation to pay an interest. So there's accountability. Um, if if profits are not, not earned, then they would fall under an issue about uh, how would they meet the interest payment obligation is there. Shareholders, once they are dissatisfied, if profits are not earned, they can withdraw their investment. That will have a negative drastic impact on the company. So there is some accountability which is there in case of a private sector. Here, taxpayer is someone who's contributing the tax amount. That amount is utilized for some purpose. Out of that, most of the time, the taxpayer is in no way getting benefit. So that accountability to clear cut drawing an accountability, making them accountable to the people who are contributing that amount doesn't exist. So now the issue becomes complicated there. Okay, so are of no benefit to the person paying the tax. This gives rise to the question of agent principle within the public sector. So they are not acting on the um, on in the best interest of the taxpayers. The taxpayers are contributing, but accountability part of it is not present there in case of public sector. The problem of agency in the public sector, further when we look into that, the those that manage a business do not own that business, but manage the business on behalf of those who do not uh, who do own it, hence the concept of agency. But in public sector, we see that the principles are different and rather than being, for example, shareholders, what I have explained, see, if in private sector, they are accountable to the uh, contributors or to the investors. Here, we do not see such things. The contributors are someone else. They do not get benefited. They are not accountable to them. 
so the agency problem uh, is on a different mode private sector it is directly related there if they are accountable they are answerable to the investors here we do not see any such thing funders and service users are there for sometimes the same uh, people but often they are not giving rise to disagreement on how so that's why the um, in many of these countries so the question always arises about how effectively are the taxpayers funds utilized okay then uh, we do look into uh, sometime back today i did explain to you about the concept of value for money so it could be measured in terms of value for money the first he talks about are they taking every possible measure to economize on the cost that is spent are they looking at um, proportionally uh, for the amount of cost that is incurred are they getting the benefit out of this cost benefit analysis and ultimately achieving the overall purpose for which the funds are achieved so measure the performance in case of public sector organization by way of measuring the value for money which is measured by three e's depicted as the three e's economy effectiveness and efficiency okay we we'll stop here okay we have stakeholder theory um, then uh, the rest of it proceeds further with approaches to government um, we will learn about uh, one day also for quite a long time we will be discussing about the governance part of it only but i as i mentioned about um, i will take up a case study on porter's five forces or some case study even on governance also one small case study can be done so some case study we will take it up on in my in the class on monday and then proceed further okay um, we do have other uh, models also little later um, but for some time we will be focusing on uh, various aspects of governance and um, then comes internal control then uh, internal audit etc so those aspects also do come into that so as in where i can fit in uh, case studies i will definitely do that um, so that we can understand how to um, attempt to answer such questions okay um attendance i will mark it um, looking into zoom account because it's time consuming yesterday i got disconnected then it was only 2 minutes left after that though i got connected i did not join back because it was already time i will mark attendance um, taking uh, the um, students attendance from zoom account because calling in so many names is not feasible for me also uh, any doubts in what we've learned in today's class anything which you want me to explain um, in a different aspect or something some clarity you require or anything else any issue which you are as i told you you can always put that in a direct message to me so that only i will look into that and then i can address that any issue okay then um, meet you on monday Okay good day